Hello everyone and welcome back to the X-Ring. I hope you had a great weekend. I was able to shoot the VOD icebreaker using the CZ MTR and shot it in PRS production division. What we're going to do is we're going to see how I did compared to all the open guys and we're going to talk about some of the rules for PRS production. So if you're interested in that, definitely stick around. So first and foremost, I'm going to give a big shout out to everyone that came up and said hello at the match. I do appreciate each and every one of you watching and even those that come out to the matches or just getting started in a PRS rimfire. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we did to prep for that match and we're going to talk about this rifle in general. Now, I'm not going to bore you guys with a bunch of match footage because I personally can't stand to watch match footage. Um, you know, it's a great training tool, I guess, but in a video, it doesn't work out so well. So how did I do? Well, ironically, remember guys, I was looking for a top 10. I was able to get first place in production division. Now on first glance, you might say, well, how many people shot production? Well, it was a sold out venue. It had 55 plus shooters with a wait list and there were six production shooters. So not bad that I finished first, but I could have been 30th, who knows? But ironically, I shot well enough to actually finish second overall. So it was a double trophy weekend. So shooting against all those open guys with this $1,349 MSRP production rifle, I was able to finish in second place overall. So while it is nice to have an open rifle, you don't necessarily need it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, and I'll show you some up close, of everything that's on this rifle, what I did to it, and let's go ahead and get into it now, shall we? All right, so starting at the back and working our way up, I left everything factory. The only thing I did was I took some matting material with some heavy-duty rubber bands, and I did make a better cheek riser. Guys, it is very, very important to make sure that when you're on the cheekbone that you have a good, solid cheek weld, and right now I'm looking directly through my scope. So if you don't have that, what's gonna happen is you're not gonna have a good index point on your face. And it's all about getting your eye lined up, basically in the center of the scope. So this is very, very important. I can't tell you how important this is. You must do it and just add the layers to where it's not gonna put you up too high because setting it up in a prone position while that works well, remember you're rarely gonna be prone in a PRS match. You're gonna have all these other positions where you're craning your neck. So you've got to make sure you can see through the scope. Coming forwards, the, the trigger is stock. I've done nothing to change this trigger. As a matter of fact, for those that might want to argue that you can modify or clip your factory spring or put in a Yo Dave spring that is completely against PRS regulations, if you change any spring out or modify any spring, now this came up at Nationals, you're technically not going to be in production division. So this is 100% stock. The only thing I did was loosen um, the lock nut and lightened it just a little bit. So I'm still at about two pounds right now, which that actually cost me a couple of points because I'm so used to a really light trigger that when I was on the target, I went to pull, it didn't go off. And I was like, oh crud. And so that's one of those things you don't necessarily have to have a light trigger, but you need to know what you're working with. So you can't change the chassis, but you can add accessories to it. 
As far as the trigger, you can change the weight, but you can't do any modifications. Has to be the factory action, has to be the factory barrel, and it needs to be modern manufacturer. Okay, it can't be something from 1970 and you say, well, you know, I paid $200 for this back in the day. Now for PRS production division, the total needs to be with the MSRP of the rifle, which I think this is $849 MSRP, and then the scope, which the scope uh, MSRP I think is like $540 or something like that. So I'm well under that $1,500 price point. Doesn't leave a, a lot of options for good scopes. Now guys, I am going to do a full review of this Arkin. This is the EP5. And I'm gonna tell you, this scope um, is very impressive. So I've actually had this Arkin EP5 for about four months or so. This isn't something that I just mounted up prior to the match. I actually used this in one of my long range classes for one of my students who had a scope that was just not gonna work. It was a duplex reticle, it had no external turrets. And for that entire day of training, he had no issues. The tracking is spot on on it. And while the glass is kind of what you would expect, it is made in China. Um, Low power actually hides a lot of imperfections. So as long as you're keeping under that 18, 20 power range or so, you're really not gonna notice that huge of a difference. Now I'm used to really good class. You guys know that I shoot Night Force and Tangent and you know Zeiss and all the other ones. And uh, you know even the Burris, the XTR Pro, it's not going to be that. This is subpar glass when it comes to those scopes, but look at it. You're looking at $600 or less with excellent tracking. It does have an illuminated reticle that was actually helpful on one stage. You can get throw levers for it. I will tell you for the entire match, I never powered up over 12 power. I shot that entire match between 10 and 12 power because you don't want to be hunting for targets through your scope. I did put a set of Vortex Precision Match rings on it because I wanted to be able to have that clearance. I didn't want it up too high, so I wanted it as low as I could get it on it. So as far as the accessories, the guys over at Area 419, I know this is some of the best stuff for the CZ. I do have the 30 minute of angle rail that will clip onto that dovetail and you tighten it down. I did replace the bolt knob. It is simply a screw on, screw off, went to the oversized bolt knob, and then I added the Arca Swiss rail. Guys, this Arca Swiss rail is more important than you can possibly imagine, and more on that later. But I'm gonna go over everything that I put on the rifle. I'm gonna go ahead and flip it around and on this side over here, you will see a Hawk Hill data card. There's enough real estate on the front of this Area 419 rail where they've extended it that I can put this data card here. Guys, I can't tell you how important a data card is, okay? Writing it on your arm or writing it on your wrist while it will get you by, that's not what you need. Um, you can buy some 3D printed type data card holders and those work great, no issues. And you want some type of level system. I'm usually using an LRA, but I have no real estate for that. So I just put the Arkin bubble level on here. It worked very, very well. No issues with it. I could see it over my parallax turret. And that was pretty much it for the optic itself. And we'll go over more on that in just a minute on what I really thought about the optic. Now, as far as the Arca Swiss rail, it is going to take a three quarter inch paddle bit that you're gonna have to inlet basically inside of the chassis. Um, I have it very secure, but you need it secure. As far as the bipod, I don't really care what kind of bipod you're running. Uh, here lately, I've been running nothing but the Thunder Beast arms. And while an Atlas is really nice, I have a lot of Atlas bipods. I think Thunder Beast for what I do, it's a lot lighter, I think, and I can do that very quickly. I'm not having to press any buttons. Um, and actually for this entire match, I only used the bipod. I think we used it on one stage. And here's actually that stage where we're shooting off a tabletop. So a bipod is a bipod, it doesn't really matter. Most of the time I was just taking the bipod off and I was shooting it with some type of rail attachment. Now, while the Game Changer, the Area 419, the Schmedium Game Changer, this is probably your, if you had to pick one bag, this would be it. But the thing that I used the most for the entire match, and that was kind of true for all of them, was the Gray Ops plate, the mini plate. And so with this Gray Ops mini plate, what I can do is, and you can slide it wherever you like, is I put it here, just forwards, I did have the brass weights in there. I left them on. If I'm doing a ruck style match, I usually take the brass plates out because I don't need that extra weight. But I wanted more of that weighting up front. 
because this is still going to be kind of butt heavy. You see that, guys? It's going to be butt heavy here. So having a little more of that weight up front is going to help offset that for the balance because it's production division. You can only do so much. Now, if you have this plate on here, it will give you the ability to set it on your Schmedium Game Changer to where you've got a nice flat surface that you can work with. However, on most of the stages, we were using the Armageddon gear. I really love this bag. The first thing you need to do when you get a bag like this, it comes with these coated hooks that clip onto the sides of the Gray Ops plate. That is a horrible idea, it doesn't work really well. It's better just to remove those hooks and to just thread it in like this is going to be your best friend, all right? So threading it in, let me just go ahead and do this and show you how this works. I don't have to worry about the clips coming undone. And there you go. So this is a sand filled. I've actually replaced it with uh, something heavier than sand, but a lot more dense. And this gives me a good solid platform. And this is a great way to shoot your stages and have something soft that you can level it out. And I'm not having to pick up another bag. I can just set it down and go. One of the things you got to know about Chris Simmons is most of his matches will have multiple positions. Typically, you're going to be looking at five positions on a 90 second stage. Everything is 90 second part time. So you're probably going to be shooting two shots from each position, five positions. That's 10 shots. However, there was one stage where it was one shot, nine positions. So while the game changer is great, me coming up off of a prop, putting this down, setting the plate and then going, I'm going to be a whole lot faster if I can just set fire, pick up, set. So anything that has a lot of movement, I won't use the Schmedium if I'm worried about time. There were a lot of people that timed out. So as far as the other side, I also forgot to mention, I actually sell these little CZ magazine holders. Uh, XRingCustoms.com is my website and I carry a lot of accessories that are made here in the USA, actually made here locally. And I sell these on my site. These are actually made for us specifically. And I have a CZ mag holder. I'm running a plus two extension. So even on the 12 round stage, I didn't have to worry about um, having to do a mag change. Now the mag changes are a little bit harder on the CZ, but I had zero malfunctions. It is a very reliable system and I really love that setup. Now let's talk about what you can expect from your very first precision rimfire match. Okay, so if you're wanting to go to your first PRS rimfire match, there's a couple things you're absolutely gonna need. Number one, you're gonna need a rifle, you're gonna need a scope, and you're gonna need to have something that can hold about a one inch group at 100 yards. You guys saw on the previous video, shooting or comparing the CZ against that motor cam, you know, it was a little over an inch or right about an inch group with the ammunition that I had. And I've told you guys a ton of times, as long as you can hold that inch group for 10 shots, you can win pretty much any match out there. You don't need something that's going to shoot bug holes. Now, while it's nice to have those, are you physically able to hold it? So it was good enough for the CZ shooting that center X, which was shooting, you know, one inch groups at hundred yards and it was shooting good groups at 50 yards. I did have a little bit of a cold bore shift in between stages, but I knew it just shot a little hair high and left and I just compensated for that. Now let's lead into this and how this whole match went. Now we had a really, really busy week at work and I had no data for this rifle because it was so new and I really hadn't had a chance to go out to the range. Now, Rick with Is Your Six Covered and Desert Precision Gunworks, Kenneth I, they were able to take my rifle out to the range and basically confirm dope for me. And what they did was they shot multiple shots on steels with a water line and told me what the exact hold was for this scope with a 50 yard zero. I think that's very important. I prefer a 50 yard zero. I think that's gonna be the most common zero. So while you can ask about 100 yards and 25 yards and 35 yard zeros, I'm gonna recommend a 50 always to shoot PRS rimfire matches, especially the ELRs or the NRL 22Xs. They simply got a 50 yard zero, confirmed it. They dialed in the 100 yard zero, confirmed it, which was 1.8 mils. Then they got me 150, 199, 250 and 300. 
Now this is where you're going to need a Kestrel to get your dope. Now before everyone starts talking about Streelock Pro, you guys know I'm a huge advocate of Streelock Pro. However, you're not going to be able to get your DSF or your drop scale factor. I've talked about that before in videos. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to add it to this video because it might be a, a little bit too much in depth. But basically, I got my muzzle velocity, which I knew was 1091. And that's always been about the same. Remember, take into account your temperature and everything else. As long as you have that dope, all I'm going to do is true out my muzzle velocity at, let's say, 150 yards. Confirm it at 100. Or I'll do it at 200. It depends on how that lines up. And then after that, I just DSF'd at 250, DSF'd at 300. That was it. I used an AB custom curve in my Kestrel, and basically it gives me my holds. I was never off on any holds. The shots that I dropped was due to wind calls because we had a lot of gusty winds out there that day. But if you do your part, and I'm not one of these that are taking a ton of wind calls with this. Um, what I usually do is I use a spotting scope. So you definitely want to have a Kestrel. You definitely want to have your dope before you go. You don't have to have a spotting scope to shoot a match, although it is very nice, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But when you show up at the match, the first thing you're going to want to do is zero. They will always have a zero time, and depending on if you're coming from a different location, you're going to want to get down there on the ground and zero. So make sure you take a shooting mat with you. Uh, I actually sell these mats. These are mats that I make. Um, it is called the X-Wing, and I think uh, they're on my site for like 99 bucks. It's not, I'm not trying to sell it. I don't want you to buy a mat if you already have one. But it was pretty ingenious on some things I did to it. I don't like plastic buckles, so I used the Auster Alpen buckle. It also has lead weights in it that are malleable. But you're going to want to be able to separate yourself from the ground. We had rain before, so the ground was very mushy. Put this on the ground, get your zero. If you need to re-zero your turret, that is the time to do it because you don't want to be adding here or taking away here. Just go ahead and zero out for those conditions at that day. You're also going to need a chamber flag. Now, you have to have a chamber flag, almost all matches. Now, there are some insert types that replicate a magazine that you can insert in and it just kind of fills the void. But the problem is, is a lot of match directors won't allow a chamber flag or a chamber safety indicator that doesn't go into the actual chamber itself. So most of them are too long to be able to get into a short CZ action. Now, if you have an MDT or something, they'll give you a chamber flag that looks like this. And while that looks perfect and it is curved so I can get into the chamber, I just don't like this hanging out of my rifle. So what I usually do is just cut one down and I'll insert it into the chamber. And once I insert it to the chamber, there's usually a bungee cord, an elastic bungee cord, go around your bolt and around your windage. So that holds it together so this doesn't come out. You're going to have to have it. Most match directors will have one at a match. So that's going to be your first thing. You've got your dope. You've got your mat because you'll be done with your mat in a few minutes. You can firm your dope. Make sure that you have your, your chamber flag. Always pull your magazine out um, when you're done shooting. Don't leave it in there even if it's empty, okay? So once you do that, they're going to do a match brief and you're going to be assigned to a squad or whatever. If you haven't already pre-signed up for one, you'll know what your squad is. Now, some matches will actually give you a match sheet. OK, they're basically a course description for the next day. If you already are comfortable with your dope, some people fill that out prior to the match. I don't recommend doing that. Um, you need to come up with a game plan and I'll tell you exactly what I do after every stage. So this is the matchbook, and I'll show you this up close. But Chris is really, really good about having these available to the shooters. A lot of match directors won't do that, and it's your responsibility to print this out the night before. I'm going to recommend you always do that. Some people put it on their phone and do a screenshot, and you can do that, but you can't really write on a phone. And so what I usually do is I will have this as basically my dope card. So more on that in just a minute. So let's say the very first stage is, let's say I was on squad four and I started on stage three, YouTubes. Well, I'll read the stage description and then what I'll do is they have the yardage here. Now I always take a set of laser range finding binoculars so that I can f confirm the distances that are on this matchbook. And I have found errors, grievous errors at multiple matches. So you always wanna confirm that uh, sometimes Sometimes they just mess up. So make sure you confirm that with the other shooters as well as far as the distance that they're getting. 
So let's say you go to this first stage and it's telling me on this, and I'll show you all this up close, eight shots, one at 50 yards, one at 63, one at 75, and one at 101. So I've got to come up with the dope. Now that's a short course. We went all the way out to 300 yards that day, but that gives me time to go ahead and spin up my Kestrel, see what my holds are or what I've got to dial, and then I will then transfer that over to a dope cart. Now, basically these are just little plastic dope cards and I don't use dry erase. That's a good way to hurt yourself because if it starts to rain or you rub it, you're gonna lose all your dope. So I actually use a Statler permanent pen and I can take it off with alcohol or they do have a, dry, a wet erase. So you can use water or whatever. So I will go ahead and put it on my rifle so that I'm ready for the next stage. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and have two magazines loaded, always. Even if you don't need it for the stage, Two is one, one is none. So I always have one mounted with 12 rounds on the side and I have one in my pocket to start. So when it's your turn to shoot, if I know that my first dope, the very first dope is going to be 1.5, I will dial this in before I ever shoot the stage so that I can't forget it, okay? So when I'm doing my mental game plan or prepping, I will go ahead and have that first dope in always, okay? So I've got it in. And they're going to say, basically, you're helping spot and score and everything else. And it's good to use the power that you plan on shooting with your scope to have something that kind of matches up. So visually, you have a reference that you're going to be going from this target to this target to this target. So that when you go to your scope, you're using reference points. Like on this one stage in particular, I said, okay, that one's going to be by the log. That log is going to stick out really, really well compared to this little tiny target. Because Simmons does use a lot of piano keys that are real time about that big. So that I've got reference points on where I need to go for my shots. So once I've got that established in my head of what the order is going to be, what position I'm going to be in, whether I'm going to be using a bipod or a bag, then that's going to help me determine my action on this course. Now, that dope card is critical. You need to make sure you have everything correct for that dope card because that's what you're going to be using. So typically what I'll do, let's say I'm shooting this stage two, two, two positions. We're just going to make up something. Two positions. And my first dope is 1.1. All right. So if I know that's going to be my first position, the RO is going to say, do you understand the course of fire? Yes. Load make ready. So you're going to take your chamber flag out. Don't throw this on the ground. That's going to get dirt all over it and everything else. Just throw it in your back pocket. You've got it so that when you unload, you've got it with you because you can't leave the line with a loaded rifle or even an unloaded rifle without a chamber flag. Then you're going to take your magazine. This is a live magazine. You're going to insert it into the magwell. <sighs> make sure your dope card's out. Make sure your parallax is kind of close and you got your game plan. So I'm going to go ahead and take this mag out so we don't get in trouble here. I don't do a garage pop. So let's say, uh, let's say we've got to do this. All right. And begin. So you're going to get on the target. You close your bolt when you're on the target, not when you're setting the rifle down. Remember, you're going to set it down. Once the target's there, you're solid. Take your breath. Close your bolt, boom. Now don't be in a hurry to move, okay? See where you hit that steel. That's gonna tell you everything. Maybe your wind call was close, but if it hit right edge, I don't wanna hit right edge again. I wanna get my next shot in the center. So take a little more time on that first shot. And if you have, let's say a barricade position and they don't tell you you have to start high, always pick your lowest, most stable position so you can break that perfect shot on the first shot and that's going to tell you everything about your decisions on your wind calls and your wind holds and everything. So let's say you did your first shot, you're back on target, second shot. This is the hardest thing for most people, is realizing that they can't just pick up their rifle. Even though that it's empty, you need to clear, leave it open, go to the next position, get on target, wait, take your breath, boom, and you're going to fire again. Okay, once you're done, you're going to drop your magazine. You can hold your rifle up in the air. Don't leave the line. There's no hurry. You're done at this point. Take your chamber flag, insert your chamber flag, and like I said, nobody's going to be rushing you. You're clear. You show clear, you leave. Now, 
you need to turn this back to zero. I make it a habit of turning it back to zero anytime I leave a line. That way it's there. Here's another thing I want to discuss. If you're practicing, practice this. Let's say you're at 1.2 mils for your first shot, right? We get down here, we shoot 1.2. There's no hurry to get over here and then adjust your dope. If your dope card's already out, and let's say I'm at 1.1, and I need to know that that position is three mils, three mils, I'm ready to go, I'm on target, I'll close and I'll go. I don't typically pick up my rifle and then try to re-dope here off my dope card. I try to get that dope in before I go unless I'm doing holdovers. So I think that's pretty beneficial. You've got to train with what works best for you. Always remember to go back to zero and try to set a zero stop if you can because that's going to keep you from getting lost in your reticle and having it on 10 as opposed to zero and being a full revolution up. Okay. Now, as far as the match, the only bags I used was the Armageddon gear with the plate, and then I used a pump pillow. You can laugh at this pump pillow all you want. This will get you points, okay? Borrow one from a friend. Borrow one from someone you don't know. Most people are willing, and we told people, if you need to use a bag, grab one of ours. I have multiples of these bags, but getting one of these from Armageddon gear can help you get into position, can support you, and will get you steady shots. And that's all I used as far as the bags for this rifle. I had no small rear bag, so it makes it a good solid platform. So I carried these three bags, but I used those two for everything but one stage, and I used this on that stage. Now, when it comes to spotting scopes, I do carry a set of binos that are laser range finding and a spotting scope. I am going to do a review of four what I consider great spotting scopes with mill reticles in there. And it's very important because it gives you a way to reference a target with regards to size and also for correction. So anytime someone's shooting, I'm looking through that spotting scope. Okay. So more on that in just a minute. Let me, let me touch base on this again. So once I get done with the stage and I've got it back to zero, I go back to the line, put my gear up, and then I'll go to the next stage. And let's say this next one, this one was at 69, 81, 114, 140, 165. I'm going to go ahead and calculate my dope. I'm going to write it down right here. I'm going to transfer that information to the dope card. I'm going to go ahead and put that first dope into my reticle. I'm going to load my mags, and then I'm done. I'm ready for when the next stage is. That's not the time to be grab-assing with your buddies and everything else. Uh, everybody knows as soon as I get off a of stage, Leave me alone for about a minute or two till I can get this done. And once it's done, then it's all back fun and games again. And be respectful of those. I mean, if you, if you have somebody in your squad and you can tell, you can tell by someone's demeanor on, you know, if it was good or bad or whatnot, then that might not be the time to ask them a question. Most everybody in PRS is going to be extremely helpful. But when you can tell they're working on something or in their Kestrel or writing down data, that's not really the time to ask them any questions. But as far as a spotting scope, a spotting scope is really going to give you the ability to size a target. If you know that first target, let's say 300 yards, measures one mil. So you're looking at this target and you're like, man, I think the wind's going to be about eight tenths. Well, you can look and see where everybody's kind of making their errors or where the tendencies are. And you're not going to get that with a bino, okay? This way you can really look and say, well, if I held, if I dial in eight tenths or if I'm going to hold eight tenths wind left or right, this will give you a better idea or an understanding of getting more impacts on that steel. So I always carry a spotting scope. I think it's critical. On a ruck match, I don't really use a spotting scope. It's too much weight. And you also want a decent tripod. I use a really right stuff, but, you know, two vets, it doesn't matter. Whatever you've got, make it work for you. But you're going to definitely want a tripod for spotting. And you can also use it for positional work for a rear support. As far as the rest of it, that's on you to practice. Remember, you don't have to have a rifle that shoots .2s or .1s like this one from Desert Precision Gunworks. You know, like I said, well, that's a great rifle, but that's an open rifle. It weighs 21 pounds, um, but you can definitely be competitive with a CZ with a setup just like this as long as you do your part and you practice. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know it was really long, but it was a lot of great information, I think. And I think you guys can use that, and um, it'll help you at your next match. So until then, I hope you guys have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one.
Yeah. What was your name? What was your name? Uh, my, my name is Juan. 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 With a J. I thought it was talentless you Hi, man. <laughs> we are at VOD at the Icebreaker. So we're, I'm going to shoot production division for the first time using that CZMTR. Let's see how it does. Right, so we got talentless YouTuber number, number one. one. Hurry up. Here we go. We are starting on stage nine. And you're going far to near, starting at 300, 297 actually. And you got to shoot everything off this bench here. So it seems like you're going to move pretty quickly. We're going to look down range. It's 300 and like 260. And then right, left, we're shooting the, the little tiny, tiny ethics. So we've got Kenny on here. Now Rick's behind him, and that's where you should be. That way you can learn what any holds are or where tendencies are. Another talentless YouTuber number two. And I'll be number three. We've got one impact. Two, three. 25 seconds. Got plenty of time. Go. There you go. Thirty seconds. Skin pack. Skin. Skin pack. I'm not giving you steady, baby. One down. Yeah, it was nine. One. Good job, Kenny. All right, so here lately I've been seeing a lot of match directors use what they call a confirmation target. That's at a fixed distance. And in this case, it's at 36 yards. So you're going to shoot target one, confirmation. Then you're going to target two, and then confirmation three, confirmation four, confirmation five, confirmation. It ends up being 10 shots, and they usually have to move after every second shot. So let's check out Rick and see how he does on this. Yeah, we're ready. Stand by, go. Target. 
Second in the top, right? Yep. Uh. Gotta move. Oh, yeah. All right, so you guys can see you gotta move very quickly and you're also, you've gotta come up on a parallax that's gonna work for you because you don't have time to be adjusting your parallax in between shots. And that confirmation target is usually at that range where you really kind of need to adjust your parallax. So just find something kind of in the middle. And like I said, it's tough to do, especially if you're powered up too much. It's easy to lose those targets. All right, so just finished up the last stage. Uh, we actually had 10 stages. Shot decently strong. Like I said, the, the rifle actually did really, really well. It just, um, the balance was a little bit off, but I made it work. The Arkenscope tracked perfectly. There were no issues with that. I'm shooting the EP5. It doesn't have two tenths hold, but it was still able to do it. And, um, you know, we had a couple of, with the confirmation target, it does have a break at the 2.5 mils, basically, and also 7.5. So it worked out pretty well. Well, let's, uh, let's see how we did. Who knows? All right. So we got easier six covered here. Fun match. How'd you do? Did decent to the last stage. <laughs> Oh, what shot happened, it, what happened there? You're supposed to shoot left to right. I, I went right to left, hit everything that I shot at. And what happens when that happens? You just get zeros for that? You get a zero, yeah. So uh, I, I missed uh, nine possible points. Got it. Well, we're done. We are walking up here to the... Uh, Don't be a dumbass. ...awards ceremony. We'll see what happens. and hope we got that top ten overall. Top we'll 10. see you. Top production. Ray Hams. Uh-oh. Mr. Ray? Well, I thought he's talentless. Talentless you two. Talentless. <laughs> and I got his autograph. With the production rifle. Third overall. Yeah, I didn't get a picture. Hey, oh, oh. All right. My bad. Yeah, third overall, too. His autograph just went way up. Oh, he did? Hey, Chris. You say second overall or third overall? Second. Uh, second overall. Okay. Damn. Nice. Even better. Oh, I, saw that. I was going to give it back. Match <laughs> winner, Andy Slade. Andy. Yeah.